Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to take you guys step by step through the character creation in Solasta and explain what things mean along the way. In a game like this, getting character creation right is actually really important, and hopefully this video will help you better understand the choices that you make and allow you to create the ultimate adventuring party. If any of you guys are looking for a more in-depth video on the races and classes specifically, I just released a video on that, and I'll leave a link below. And of course, if you guys end up enjoying this this video please subscribe i really really do appreciate it i'll also leave links to my twitter and my discord server below as well let's get right into it So we're about to start a new adventure in Solasta. And as you can see, we have four empty slots here, and that's because you get to make four custom characters. If you want, you can choose a couple pre-made ones as well. But for the most part, most of you guys are gonna make a custom party of four. And you're gonna start with your first character by clicking on select right here, and then clicking on new character. So the first screen in character creation is your racial choice, or as Solasta calls it, your ancestry choice. But I'm gonna recommend that you actually move on to the class choice first and then come back to your racial choice and I'll tell you why just in a minute so go ahead and just click on any of the races that you want hit next and let's take a look at the classes so once you decide which class you want to be it's a lot easier to figure out which race is going to go well with that class because each class has a primary ability that they need to really make sure that they boost in character creation and this primary ability is going to help the class with what they do mainly for uh, attacking situations so a wizard their primary ability is going to be intelligence and their spells are powered by your intelligence modifier so for a wizard it's intelligence a ranger for example most rangers are going to have dexterity as their primary ability because they're going to be using bows and finesse weapons and dexterity is going to help with their armor so when you figure out which class that you want to play then you can go back and choose a race because each race is going to offer a boost in a couple ability scores for example if we look at the hill dwarf here they get a plus two to constitution and also a plus one to wisdom so if I wanted to play a hill dwarf I would probably try to figure out in my head if it goes well with the class that I want to play so if I wanted to play as a wizard um, the hill dwarfs not offering any boost to intelligence so if I really wanted to optimize my class and racial choice together then I probably wouldn't play a wizard as a hill dwarf but if we take a look at the high elf the high elf offers a plus one to intelligence so that's going to help greatly as a wizard when you assign your ability scores and the high elf also offers a plus two to dexterity which is also useful to a wizard so the high elf's a great choice for the wizard and since i'm going to create a ranger in this video the sylvan elf works great with the ranger because it's a plus two to dexterity which is the ranger's primary ability score and also that plus one to wisdom that it offers is great because ranger's spell casting ability is wisdom so a higher wisdom modifier is going to help with spell casting and dexterity is going to help with the ranger's bow or their finesse weapons among various other benefits now you don't have to necessarily optimize your class and racial choice have fun do what you want to do but it's recommended especially on your first playthrough to kind of line them up a little bit better it's definitely going to help you be a little bit more powerful and survive some more situations because Celasta can absolutely be brutal and in the video description below I'll give you guys a quick chart that tells you which ability scores are the primary ability scores for each class and I'll put one, a couple maybe two or three ability scores that are most important per class and you guys can reference that when you're choosing your race now also for your racial choice you can see there's a bunch of racial features I'm not going to going to go over it in this video because I already did a video on that but just take note of different features a lot of the races offer dark vision I definitely recommend dark vision especially if you're a beginner it helps you be able to attack enemies much easier in the dungeon darker environments without needing a light source all the time which can be a pain in the butt sometimes so i do recommend dark vision and then every race is just going to have all sorts of different features as you can see the human doesn't really have much um, but it also has a different benefit to it because you get a plus one to all ability scores meaning the human can go well with every class and the last thing I might quickly worry about when you're choosing your race is which weapon proficiencies it comes with. Now, if you know which class you're playing, for example, I'm going to play as a ranger. The ranger has proficiency in both simple and martial weapons, which means they can use every weapon in the game and use it well. So I don't really have to worry about choosing a race that gives me a special weapon proficiency because the ranger already offers both of those proficiencies for me. But if I was playing as a rogue, you can see that they're only proficient in simple weapons 
long swords, rapiers, and short swords. If I wanted to use a bow as a rogue and be effective with it, I would have to go back and choose maybe, I think the only race that offers bow proficiencies is the Sylvan Elf and the High Elf. So you have to keep that in mind, um, what weapons you want to use with your class, and then also figure out that configuration with class to race. You'll also notice in the bottom right that you can choose between male and female. Make sure that you choose what you want there. And on the left side of the screen, you kind of have a summary of what you're getting a bonus in. And since we're on the Sylvan Elf, you can see we have a plus two to dexterity and a plus one to wisdom, which is exactly what it says here in the ancestry features. All right, back to the class screen. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here. Like I said, I went into this in depth in a video. The link to that is below. If we take a look at the classes, of course, they have their features labeled on the right side here you have saving throw proficiencies which is your chance to resist or mitigate damage from certain spells you have your armor proficiency so if you really want to use heavy armor in this game make sure that you're playing a class that offers heavy armor because not all classes do and below this you can see that as a ranger you're trained to craft basic ammunition so that's like a special ranger thing not all classes are going to have the same features so make sure that you look into this now also at the top right you can see that it says at higher levels. So you can really kind of scope out which class you want and see if it's going to offer what you want in your playthrough. So if we click at higher levels, we have a little chart here that tells us everything that we gain as a ranger. So nothing really is a mystery in this game when you're leveling up. This is mostly, um, actually it's very well accurately, that's not how you say it. It's, very, it's a very good interpretation of D&D 5th edition rules, um, almost to a T with some of these classes. So on this screen, you can see everything that you get when you level up as a ranger level three level four level six level eight all the way to the max level and also for all of the classes you can see a little tab here for the ranger it says ranger archetypes for the paladin it says sacred oaths for the fighter it says martial archetypes if you click on this it's going to show you which subclass choices you're going to be presented with and this could either be at level one two or three depending on which class you're playing now as a fighter it says these subclasses are granted at level three so when we reach level three we're going to be going to be presented with champion mountaineer or spellblade and also you can see everything that comes with that subclass choice that you're going to choose for example spellblade you get spell casting you get into the fray at level seven so make sure to really look into which class you want and see as that character develops throughout the game if that's stuff that you really want to take with you and the last thing I want to quickly look at here is in the bottom right of the class selection screen and this is editing your starting equipment and right now I have the fighter selected and you can see we're presented with some choices here. We can either start with chainmail which is heavy armor or start with le leather armor with a longbow and 20 arrows. So if you're going to be a heavy armor wearing great sword wielding fighter you're obviously going to want to start with chainmail. If you're going to be a dexterous fighter using a bow you'll probably pick the leather with the longbow. Now this choice is not permanent you will find more weapons as you keep playing but you might as well start off with equipment that fits what your style is and then below that you can choose to start with a shield with a one-handed weapon or dual wielding light crossbow or hand axe and then you have a choice between two different starter packs so the dungeoneers pack which comes with 10 torches a potion of healing and some other things while the explorers pack only comes with five torches but it comes with a small smith toolkit which the dungeoneers pack didn't have and projectile parts which the dungeoneers kit didn't have this is not a permanent choice just choose a pack that you think is going to most benefit you in the beginning of the game all right now on to our background choice now whichever background choice you end up going with is also not an end-all be-all choice but there are a couple things to keep in mind here when you're choosing a background you're mostly thinking about which skill proficiencies it comes with and also what type of personality you want your character to have if we click on academic you can see that the academic comes with proficiency in arcana nature and insight and the acolyte is religion nature and insight so an example of the religion skill in use might be if you're in a dungeon in Celasta and you come up to a religious type statue if your character has proficiency in religion they might be able to get a little bit more lore out of it and make your playthrough that much better I guess you could say some of the skills are not really that important in the scope of things but they do offer little variations in your playthrough versus a player who plays without that skill proficiency 
Now there are other skills that might have more of an effect on the gameplay itself, such as stealth. So if you have proficiency in stealth, you're going to be able to sneak better than a character that doesn't have proficiency in stealth. And this can be translated into combat situations a little bit as well. So choose a background that has skills that you think are going to be interesting and important to you on your playthrough. Now you'll also notice that each background comes with these extra little features. I won't go over them, but for example, you can see background equipment changes for each background. The low life really has no background equipment while the acolyte starts with a little bit of gold and a crafting starter pack. And below this, you have your background personality flags of which you get to choose two and then another two. And each background, those personality flags are going to change. So for the aristocrat, you can see that we can choose authority, lawfulness, egoism, and altruism. And when you make these choices, what it's really going to affect is the dialogue that presents itself to you in the game. So in Celasta, when you're talking to an NPC, when it's your time to respond back to them, on your screen will pop up a response from each of your characters. So you're gonna have four characters, so there'll be four different responses. And depending on the personality flags that you choose for your character is going to determine what type of responses you get. So if you have authority on your character and lawfulness, um, the dialogue options for that character might pop up and they're going to be very um, authoritarian, I guess you could say. While a character who plays as a low life can have kindness or even greed and it's going to just have different effects on the dialogue but remember this dialogue doesn't affect the outcome of the story so this is kind of like a little rp touch and i have to admit that it's actually really well done in this game and one of my favorite things about this game is getting into this dialogue and seeing the humor behind it and the different personalities from each of my characters so take this decision like kind of seriously i recommend diversifying your four companions or your your four characters and maybe making a character that is authoritative while another one that's more kind one's cautious one's more violent as you can see here on the bottom you get to choose two more so i have to go ahead and choose two which is based on my background i guess i'll be a low life ranger and we'll go with sure kindness and caution and then below is this kind of D, &D alignment thing um, which this doesn't change each background this is the same for all the backgrounds only the top personality flags change when you change the background and I guess we'll go with we'll do another kindness and maybe pragmatism sure so like I said whatever you choose here is going to make different dialogue trigger in your game and it's quite humorous so choose some funny things and have fun with it all right now on to assigning our ability scores perhaps the most confusing part of character creation at the top here, you'll notice that it says dice rolls and point buys. So these are two different systems for assigning your ability scores. If you love D&D, &D, tabletop D&D, &D, and you want to kind of use a method that's more similar to what a lot of tabletop players do, and that's rolling the dice, you have the option to roll the dice right here. Now, the problem with this is when you're playing tabletop D&D, &D, you have a DM there that's kind of monitoring what you do, so you can't roll a million times and get the best scores that you want but in Solasta you can just sit here and keep re-rolling until you see the highest score combination that you can get and this is okay because everybody this is not like an online multiplayer competitive game so everybody do whatever the heck you want but if you want to be serious about this game and play it the D&D &D way then maybe only roll it one time and stick with the results so as you can see here when I click on re-roll it says re-roll six ability scores using 46 and keeping the three best rolls you don't really have to understand that just know that that's kind of what the game is telling us they're doing behind the scenes to arrive at all of these different numbers right here so if you want to go with the roll system choose the limit for how many times you want to roll or just roll a million times till your heart's content you can also click over here on standard array which gives you 15 14 13 12 10 and 8 and this isn't necessarily a bad way to play as it keeps your character from being overpowered but also not being 
too weak. And then my personal favorite for video games is the point buy system. And the reason why this is my favorite system is because you get some customization with your ability scores, but you also are not allowed to become overpowered or underpowered. So I think it's like a nice balanced way for playing this game. But before we get into assigning points at the bottom, I want you guys to take notice of this plus two and this plus one. And if you guys recall, when we chose our race, which was a Sylvan elf, we got a plus two to dexterity and a plus plus one to wisdom, which is exactly what's getting applied down here for our ability score points. You can see dexterity, we have a two, and a wisdom, we have a plus one. So the base score that all the ability scores start out at is eight, but then we have the plus two and dexterity making it a 10, and a plus one in wisdom starting us off with a nine. And one more thing before we get into assigning these points is, you got to understand that your ability score itself, the number eight, is not really what the game cares about. What the game cares about is your ability score modifier. I know this is starting to sound a little bit confusing, probably. So if you take a look at strength over here, with an eight in strength, we have a minus one modifier. So if we did anything that required strength in the game, the game's going to roll the dice and then subtract one from our outcome. If we had a zero in strength, which is a 10, then it's not going to subtract anything. Now, if we had a 14, we have a plus two modifier. So if we did anything with strength, the game's gonna roll a 20-sided die and then add two to it. So you're probably noticing right now that the odd numbers don't actually increase your ability score. So if we have an eight in strength, we have a minus one. If we bump it up to nine thinking that it's going to help, well, it didn't because we're still at a minus one. But the minute we get to 10, that minus one goes to a zero. And when we get to 12, it's a plus one, 14 is a plus two, and then you can't go any higher than 15 in the point by system unless you have that racial boost. And just to show another example of this, let's go back to the standard array. And if I take a 14 and drag it into Charisma right here, the 14's a plus two modifier. If I drag the 15 into Charisma, it's still plus two. So until we're able to increase our ability score by one with Charisma, which would be at level four when you're able to increase two ability scores by one or one by two, that extra point into Charisma is not really doing anything unless you have plans to increase it in the future. So for the most part in this game, you wanna keep your ability scores even. It's not always going to work out like that, but try to keep them even unless you have a solid plan to increase that odd number to an even number when you reach level four. So let's go back to the point by system. And since I'm playing a ranger, I wanna make sure that I focus on dexterity first and foremost. And kind of the general rule of thumb is you want your primary ability to be a 16 right away in character creation, because a 16 is going to give you a plus three modifier. Now I did say that 15 was max, but if you have that racial bonus, then you can get it higher than 15. So for dexterity, we can get Get it all the way up to 17 but since i don't know if i want that odd number right now i'm going to drop it down to 16 with the plus three modifier so my primary ability is taken care of i have a plus three it's a solid way to start the game now the ranger also needs constitution for their HP and holding concentration on spells and wisdom for the ranger's spell casting. So these are gonna be the next two ability scores that I focus on. And typically the other ability scores that are important, you probably want at at least 14 and maybe get one of them to 16. Now, since I have the plus one in wisdom for my racial choice, I can get my wisdom to 16 as well, which is going to help with our spell casting. And then constitution, the highest I'm going to be able to get it is 15, but since 15 is an odd number, I'm going to drop it down to 14 and this leaves us with four points remaining in our pool and you're usually going to dump one of the stats and for a ranger you could dump charisma or strength I'm going to dump charisma because dialogue is not as important in here and strength is going to help us jump a little bit further among a couple other benefits so let's boost strength to a 10 because I want that zero modifier a nine is not going to do much and then I'm also going to boost intelligence because your character is going to have to do some intelligence saving throws to resist certain spells in the game. So if we boost intelligence to 10, then we have a zero modifier instead of a minus one, and I have a pretty decent ranger build for the start of the game. 
So a quick recap, make sure to focus on your primary ability score. If I was playing a wizard, I would want to get my intelligence to likely 16. And then wizards also um, rely a lot on dexterity and constitution. So I would try to get dexterity to, to 14 or 16 and get my wizard's constitution to 14 as well. And that's kind of like a, a decent way for developing your character and character creation. Some of you guys might have noticed that my ability scores did change. And I did this while I wasn't recording. I'm actually going to roll with two odd numbers. And when I get to level four, increase my dexterity from 17 to 18 and my constitution to 16. And I did this by sacrificing a couple points in wisdom with my personal ranger i want him to be a little bit more tanky and serve focus a little bit more on survivability as opposed to spell casting so i made a couple alterations right there over here on the left side of the screen is kind of a recap of what we've done so far and behind me the webcam is our personality choices and now we are on to the next screen which is actually the last one before our character's appearance and this is all of our proficiencies at the top here, you can see that we have a little knight's helmet over the dexterity and strength saving throws. And we got strength and dexterity saving throw proficiency with our choice of the ranger class. Each class offers different saving throw proficiencies. And this is our ability to resist or mitigate damage from certain spells and a couple other things. The reason why you see a plus five right here is because since we're proficient in dexterity saving throws, proficiency bonus is plus two. But dexterity saving throws also take into account our dexterity modifier, which is plus three. So we have a total of plus five. If you look at charisma, we're at a minus one because we're not proficient in charisma saving throws. So we don't get that plus two. And our charisma modifier is minus one from our when we assigned our ability scores. And below saving throw proficiencies, we have our skill proficiencies, and we get to choose some of these, but some of these have already been chosen because of our background choice. So our background as a low life gave us sleight of hand, stealth, and deception. And you can see that the little knight's helmet is in all three of those skills, meaning that we get that plus two. And then you can see though, once again, that stealth, instead of being a plus two, is actually a plus five. If you follow the column all the way up, you can see that it's part of the dexterity column right here. And we have a plus three mod modifier for dexterity so when we have a stealth check in the game we get a plus five added to our dice rolls making us that much more likely to succeed now because we chose the ranger class we get to choose three skills from animal handling athletics insight investigation nature perception survival and stealth and this is going to change depending on which class you chose um, and you can see right here that a couple of these choices are lit up and we can choose those but we only get to choose three you'll notice that some of the skills have this little information box that says although part of the rule set and valid for role playing purposes this element is not used in the crown of the magister main campaign so i don't quite know what that means i'm assuming that it just means that animal handling is a useless skill to have in this game and maybe it's going to be added later or something like that so maybe avoid the skills that have the information box if you can but in this case i have to choose three skills from only four that are lit up so i'm going to go with insight investigation or i'm going to go with insight in nature and then i have to choose one of them that um, won't be that useful so we'll just go with investigation and underneath skills we have tools and this is the result of the decisions we made up to this point in character creation as a low life ranger we have proficiency with smith tools and thieves tools and as you can see right here it says these specialists are needed to pursue a craft or trade so it's good to have somebody in your party that is proficient with smith's tools so they can make arrows and make weapons and then we also have thieves tools which is going to help with lock picking so when you're making your party of four you're going to want to try to diversify your tool proficiencies the best that you can and just take note of what each character has you don't really need four characters with a smith tool proficiency it's better to uh, diversify that a little bit so you have some opportunities to do other things in the game And below the tool proficiencies, we have all of our weapon and armor proficiencies. This is just a summary of what we have. So we can use all weapons and get that proficiency bonus. We can use light and medium armor and shields as our ranger. And below this is our languages 
category and the reason why i can't make any choices here is because a low life ranger doesn't get any extra languages to choose from so right now as a ranger we can speak common dwarvish elvish and halfling you can see that halfling is useless in the game right now but some other classes and backgrounds that you choose might allow you to choose from a much larger list and choose a couple extra languages to know and the languages in this game from my experience really only come into play by adding a little extra to your lore in the game if you come across a book that's written in orcish one of your characters can read it and then you get like that little tidbit of information but it's not like game changing or anything like that and that is it for character creation i feel like the last 10 minutes of me talking i kind of was not losing focus but i wasn't articulating well enough let me know below in the comments if this helped you guys we'll go on to the next screen quickly so you can see this is the uh character creator for those of you that haven't bought this game yet it's obviously not uh <laughs> Alarian Studios character creator um, the Celasta budget was much smaller than the Baldur's Gate 3 budget but yeah you can do a couple things in here it's pretty cool you got voice all sorts of things and that's it guys thanks so much for watching I guess I'm not going to do an outro scene we're just going to end it right now really appreciate it I have a ton of Celasta content already out and much more to come um, yeah subscribe to the channel and hope to see you guys soon Oh, and hey, I'll also be streaming this game, and my stream schedule is posted on the About section of the Wolfheart FPS YouTube. I don't stream on Twitch, I stream on this channel. So turn on those bell notifications, check out the schedule, maybe I'll see you guys around. Peace.